All right, we are back from executive session. Uh, we are on to the consent agenda. Nothing's been pulled. Is there a motion? Move so that we second. <laughs> moved by Councilor Agnew, second by the Deputy Mayor to approve the consent agenda. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, place your vote. Uh, passes unanimously with Rose Councilmember McAuliffe um, absent at the moment. She'll be here <coughs> momentarily. Next, we're on to a public hearing, AB-19-158, Nursing Home Code Amendments. Uh, we are officially opening the public hearing and we have Mr. Boyd to kick it off. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members, and good evening. I just have a very brief uh, presentation uh, on this uh, code amendment. Uh, the purpose of these amendments uh, is to consider uh, uh, the ap an ap application to allow nursing homes as a conditional use in selected single family zones. Uh, the, this is a privately uh, requested code amendment. Uh, the uh, owner of uh, the uh, single uh, nursing home uh, currently in Bothell, uh, Bothell Healthcare, uh, is with us tonight and available to answer questions. Monica Saluski uh, and her team are here uh, to answer uh, any questions you might have. Um, the proposal uh, and the recommendation from uh, Planning Commission is to add uh, R5400 and R7200 zones uh, to the zones where uh, nursing homes are allowed as a conditional use uh, with the following criteria. Uh, limit the sites, uh, limit it to sites of at least four acres that are on arterials, have access from arterials, and to add special setback and landscaping regulations to protect adjacent single family uh, zones. Uh, I, I should have uh, mentioned that uh, the reason uh, that the uh, applicant uh, needed to apply for a code amendment is that uh, um, this is in Snohomish County. Uh, it is in a R7200 zone where we don't currently allow uh, nursing homes, so it's it's considered a legal non-conforming use. It was established uh, under Snohomish County rules. Um, the uh, the map uh, on the right there is part of our analysis to uh, understand uh, where these uh, uh, code amendments, these conditions, would apply. And basically there are six uh, sites, uh, largely undeveloped sites uh, citywide, uh, where in, in R5400 and R7200 zones uh, that, that might be uh, candidates uh, for a new uh, nursing home in, in addition to the existing site uh, number one up in the upper left corner there. Um, and uh, that was so that the Planning Commission uh, understood that these code amendments wouldn't uh, limit it to just that site, and and, and uh, which would be uh, uh, make it op open for uh, challenge as a spot zone, uh, but uh, also wouldn't uh, allow them in too broad of an of, of an area. There were concerns about that. Uh, so, as part of the analysis, the other the other parcels that uh, are shown here, and and the ones in kind of the mustard yellow, are the ones. Uh, uh, in uh, on arterials in R5400 and R7200 zones. The other ones, we also looked at uh, sites that were on collectors uh, and uh, at uh, the possibility of going to uh, allowing them in R8400 and R9600 zones as well. Planning Commission uh, chose to, to limit that to R5400 and R7200 zones on arterials. Uh, the analysis, uh, just to take a closer look at the other sites besides the, uh, the existing site, um, these are maps uh, showing uh, those um, other five sites. Uh, and of course, uh, it would be possible for uh, somebody to, to uh, uh, assemble properties that are already developed or redevelop a par property. But these are the ones that we felt were uh, largely undeveloped or, or uh, subject to redevelopment. Uh, where where this m uh, might most likely uh, apply. Uh, but uh, the uh, applicants also let us know that because of the state rules uh, regarding nursing homes, uh, in their uh, opinion, it's, it's highly unlikely that uh, uh, the state would grant any more beds uh, for nursing homes in the city of Bothell. So this is somewhat hypothetical exercise. Um, the applicants uh, desire 
is merely they're not planning to add any beds, but they would like to expand their facility so that they have more private beds. Uh, a number of their current beds, uh, they have 99, uh, are um, uh, shared, shared uh, uh, in shared rooms. So with that, uh, I would uh, entertain any clarifying questions from council uh, before you take uh, public testimony and uh, go into deliberations and then uh, a motion and vote to approve the recommended action with any amend amendments if you have, have any. All right, is there questions, council member Zorns? Well, I, I was shocked that the state wouldn't allow more nursing homes for Bothell. That's what, what we've been told by the applicants who are, are familiar with the, the state uh, regulations uh, on these facilities. Well, my opinion's not being asked for, but I'm going to give it anyway. Um, Bothell, we don't have a hospital. I mean, we have some medical centers, and so where we can find ways to add to medical care quality for our community and communities around us, I was kind of disappointed to hear that. Um, but I'm glad we have what we do have. I had a dear friend who spent some time in that facility rehabbing, so I'm familiar with it. Um, I have a couple questions about the code. The 25 foot setback and the 10 foot landscape. You know, you get a little way from, ways away from planning commission, you start to forget things. Is that 25 feet and a 10 foot landscape buffer or is it 10, foot landscape buffer within that 25 foot setback? It's within, so it, the, okay. the code language says a 25 foot setback including a 10 foot uh, okay. type two landscape buffer. Okay, that's what I was thinking it was going to go. Uh, then the other question is, just trivia question, because you know pretty much how single family homes, when they're up against a different use, what is the setback like if you had a town home where you had single family homes abutting a, a something that could be zoned for town homes? What's the uh, setback for that, just as a comparison? So um, in, I didn't, I, I, I did get your, these questions in advance, but I didn't quite understand that one. In uh, uh, R2800 and R4000 uh, zones, the rear setback is 25 feet. So okay. the same as what's being so it's proposed comparable. here. Uh, this adds the 10 foot landscape buffer that okay. doesn't exist for those. Okay. Uh, for uh, R5400, which is another zone where you might get uh, townhomes, um, uh, I think the rear setback is 15 feet. So this is, is goes Still beyond that. Within. Okay. And then in, in the downtown, uh, in downtown transition district where we're seeing a lot of the townhomes built, um, they, that also has a, a 15 foot rear setback. Right. And, and, it, uh, and the, the 25 foot, uh, the special setback of 25 feet with 10 feet of landscaping was borrowed from the down, the uh, requirement for uh, downtown transition development adjacent to single family okay. zones. I do appreciate the consistency there. Um, I had a little note. Uh, I don't know why it struck me. It was like a no brainer, but having um, consistency in materials that reflect nearby development. And I thought it's, it's just one of your, uh, in building materials that it would, would would be consistent and compatible with neighbor, the neighboring community. And I just wanted to say, I appreciate that being put in there because I look at things like that when I'm out and about and I just assume it naturally happens, but in today's yeah. world, it wouldn't. So I appreciate that language in there. Uh, then the other qu last question I have is the height on this. Are we staying at one story or are we going two stories? Or do uh, we know yet? The height limit is uh, in, uh, determined by the underlying zoning in, in both our 5400 and our 7200, it's 35 feet. 35, so. okay, all right, thank you. And w one uh, uh, regarding the, uh, the 
possible uh, obstacles to building new nursing homes due to state regulations. There are other facilities that are regulated differently, like adult family homes uh, that serve a similar purpose. Uh, so those, we are seeing a number of those being built uh, in Bothell. Uh, residential care facilities is another definition with right. another uh, different set of rules. So. Uh, it doesn't mean that no facilities serving this uh, need or uh, will be built, uh, uh, and state regulations can change. So, well, I know in this facility you're also providing what physical therapy services. You're, you're, you're more. That's correct. More yeah. encompassing than, uh, than. Um, so it's not just for seniors, also. Right. It's, uh, right. For anybody okay. recovering from surgery that uh, needs care beyond their hospital stay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember McAuliffe. I just wanted to clarify because you did raise this and I, this was my question was, how does a nursing home um, differ from an adult family home or residential care facility? So I, I'm, there may be something that, I just wanna be sure that we still have that ability to have the other um, adult family homes and the residential care facilities available to our, for our seniors or our people who need care. Yes, these code amendments don't change the regulations for either of those. Okay. I, and I guess I am concerned that the state regulates this as well. So I will look into that too. Thank you. Councilmember Olson. Uh, just so in the, looks like the planning commission deliberations uh, there is items 14 and 15. I was just seeing if Department of Commerce completed their re review and if they had any comments. The, uh, that's a good question and I, I got that question at about a quarter to five this afternoon and wasn't, and uh, it uh, was a, uh, a reminder that I hadn't heard and hadn't checked and wasn't able to to confirm with Commerce. We did uh, request an expedited review the day after Planning Commission made its recommendation knowing that it was coming to Council uh, tonight uh, and, um, and, and I just don't, don't uh, have an answer for that. There is a 30 day, um, it's, it's 30 days after adoption be before it becomes effective which would put it uh, within the, the standard uh, uh, 60 day review period. Um, uh, uh, without the expedited review, but uh, I'll have to I'll have to check on that uh, um, to, to uh, determine the status. Uh, hopefully, I'll hear back from Commerce tomorrow. And if I could just add to that, Councilmember, this is the type of thing that the reason we requested expedited review is it's a fairly limited and straightforward type of amendment. Um, what Commerce typically looks for is something that has uh, more wide-reaching impacts in terms of other effects on, on different zones or capacities or, or those types of things. So all, all that to say, we don't anticipate that they're gonna have any any concerns or, or give us much feedback, if any, on this. All right, yeah, that was, that was gonna be my follow-up question. It was really what was the ex expectation from the review, because I'm sure we get lots of reviews and go through this. In, in with my 14 and a half years, uh, I have never received a single comment from com Commerce on this, uh, these 60 day reviews. All right, so small. Yes. Uh, and then just the, the SEPA, uh, so are we the lead agency on the yes. SEPA, so it's just all internal procedure? Yes. So we issued a, a determination of non-significance uh, again on September 5th, the day after the Planning Commission recommendation, so that the that uh, comment period and appeal period has, has completed as of 4 p.m. today. And there have been no comments or appeals. All right, sounds good, thank you. So Dave, I just out of curiosity, the other few sites, has anybody that owns those properties came forward and said they're interested in this code, code amendment? No, uh, and we didn't do, uh, um, we did a, a, a courtesy mailing uh, within 500 feet of the subject site, uh, but otherwise we relied on our, uh, our um, required uh, notification in, in the um, Imagine Bothell notice uh, in the Seattle Times, uh, and, uh, and there were no comments at all uh, through the Planning Commission process. 
And is this our one time a year minor code amendment for the comprehensive plan or is there? This is just a code amendment, not a plan amendment. It's not a plan amendment. Okay, just sorry, just checking. Okay, those are my questions. Is there, oh, sorry. We're ready for uh, public comment. So the first person is uh, James Johnson. Oh, these are people that signed up. How about Laura Usum? These are all familiar names. Mia Johnson, I think these are Aaron Powers. I think those were the high school kids. Was Does anybody want to pu provide public comment on this? Good, okay. All right, so um, if there's deliberation or we can have a motion. I move that we adopt the recommended nursing home code amendments. Second. Moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councilmember Zorns to adopt the recommended nursing home code amendments. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, place your vote. Uh, passes unanimously. We are on to AB 19-159, confirmation of Judge Mara Rosano. Did I get that correct? Yes. And I believe we have uh, City Manager. I do. There you go. Uh, ahead. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce you to um, the uh, individual that we as a team have um, selected to be our next municipal court judge. Um, Judge Mara Rosano currently works for the Monroe uh, Municipal Court. She went through a very rigorous uh, recruitment process and came out as our top candidate. We had a very talented pool of people. Um, and so um, to have Judge Rosano be our top candidate, it tells you the caliber of individual that she is. Um, we are really delighted that she applied for the position and is accepting the position. Um, her experience in, in Monroe was particularly of interest to us. She built that court from, bo from the bottom up and you could see during the interview process the passion and the caring that she has for the Monroe community in that court. I know it's a difficult decision for her to leave that court. Um, but she sees a lot of potential here with us in Bothell, and I think that she can take us to the next step. Uh, Judge Rosano has a bachelor's of, uh, degree in business administration and got her Juris Doctorate from University of Washington. Her experience along with being a municipal um, judge in Monroe, she was a deputy prosecuting attorney for Snow County and was also an assistant city attorney for the city of Kent. Um, we're just delighted that she's here with us this evening and she's going to say a few words and if council would like to ask her any questions, this is my recommendation for appointment for the next municipal court judge and it requires council um, affirmation of, of that appointment. Good evening. <clears throat> Um, I am Mara Rosano. I am currently the judge in the city of Monroe at the municipal court. Um, it was a hard decision, but I think that Bothell has a tremendous amount to offer. Um, it's a fantastic community, and I know that you've had some, some hiccups along the way. I'm excited to dive in and tackle some of those. I've um, heard about the and seen the, the uh, court study you had done, and I think that um, with Courtney's help, I'm gonna, gonna hopefully jump in and make some changes, but not not over sweeping. Um, one of the things that I like to do is kind of get a feel before I try thinking that I'm smarter than everybody. Um, generally speaking, any time I've done that, I've found myself facing somebody with like a PhD in astrophysics or something like that. So I've been put in my place. Um, I'm a native of Washington. Um, I'm actually fifth generation Washingtonian. I descend from Ira Wooden, who founded Woodenville, and Captain Hill, both sides of my family. I have, I have pioneers and immigrants. So we have some, I have, the Italian last name was honestly received and I actually lived and worked in Italy for a little while, going back to the old country. For, um, so I have a very unique mix in the way that I approach things. Um, hopefully that will come through and be a positive thing for Bothell. I don't know if I can tell you, I, I live at home with my husband and about 300 pounds worth of dog flesh. <laughs> um, and I have- Is that one dog or multiple it's, it's, dogs? It's actually, <laughs> no, it's just, actually just checking. three. I, I, I can't quite take on the, the Swiss mountain dog. I have German Shepherds and a Black Lab. Um, 
What else? I have two grown sons, uh, stepsons, and they're in, one is in the area where the other one is a major in the army. And so all over the place. And he's the one who's a major has given me two beautiful grandchildren. Um, anything you'd like to know about me? Um, you'll have a chance to see me more than you probably will want to, at least in the beginning here. And I like to keep people up to date on what's happening, and I like to tell you about my successes. And I will begrudgingly admit my failures. <laughs> OK? Anything? Questions? I'm just I'm happy that you uh, have read, our, th read the study and you have uh, interest in, in implementing some of those things. It was kind of a, it was discouraging some of the things that we heard in that study. So that's great that. You know, and, and it's just a challenge. Everything is, you know, and I don't know about you, but sometimes things like that give me a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, something to work on. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thanks for that intro. I wanted to ask what your philosophy is around restorative justice. Um, thank you. Um, I run my court in Monroe, which is substantially smaller than your court. We do, we do criminal cases one day a week. It's all day, but it's one day a week. But I, we don't have the resources or the ability at this time to do a community court. So I run my court like a community court. Um, one of the biggest things about a community court is the connection between the judge and the attorneys, law enforcement, and the individual who's before you. I have some success stories that I have, I hold on to dearly. I have a couple of young people that, well, they're not young anymore, but at about 13, they started their trip on heroin. Um, and law enforcement in Monroe were familiar with them, especially one young lady. They tried and tried to steer her away. They'd done, you know, tough love. They'd worked with her parents. They'd done all kinds of things. And I'm happy to say that after appearing in front of me and working with her, some of it being going to, to jail and holding her there until she, she dried out, um, some of it just being the way that we interact, she stops by the court regularly to show us her um, son who was recently born. Um, she is now a manager of a business in Monroe. Um, I guess I'm going backwards. She's clean and sober now for over two years. And law enforcement, uh, my, one of my marshals is retired Monroe police officers, Monroe native, and every time he sees her, he cries because of that success. I have two brothers similarly heading down that road. Thorns in the side of law enforcement like you wouldn't believe. And I'll cut to the chase. They both have their GED now. They've both enrolled in community um, college. The older brother has been clean and sober. If I am going to get it right for about 15 months, the younger brother probably is about at his year mark. Um, when they got their GED, I threw them a graduation party with cupcakes. Um, that's the kind of belief I have is that the restorative justice at this level where the rubber meets the road is the most important thing you can do. Um, I have through 23 years as a prosecutor and in my five years, almost five years at Monroe, I have a philosophy that the people who appear in front of you are not what you're judging. You're judging the act, not the person. You treat the person with respect. You let them know that you believe in them and that they can achieve what what they need to achieve to become active parts or at least productive parts of their community and they can do it um, one more story along my my because i reminded myself i was walking out of the fred meyer in monroe one day and i had a woman walk up to me smiling from ear to ear telling me you know judge rosano judge rosano and of course you're sitting there going who's this who's this who's this and she looked at me and she said, I just got my new teeth. The University of Washington Dental gave me new teeth. I'm clean and sober, and I just today went to my son's wedding. I reunited with my family. It's like, you can't buy that. That's the kind of stuff. And I say this, and I say I hold on to them as my successes. I also note that, yes, I gave them the ability to do what they needed to do, but it was their fight. They won that fight. Now they may have a, more battles down the road, 
And that's the, those are the sad ones. And so, like I said, I begrudgingly tell my, my failures too. Last Christmas, on, Chris <clears throat> on the 23rd, I received notice that I lost one of my people. Um, we had her, and I, and I say we because we have the embedded social worker, we have law enforcement that are participating. And we'd managed to get her into clean and sober. Um, we got her into a 30-day inpatient. We got her into clean and sober housing. Everything looked like it was really working out. And I think she went out to celebrate one time. And heroin is absolutely deadly that way because you build up a tolerance when you're a user. And if you go back out and use that same amount after you've been clean, it will be deadly. And it was for her. And I, we lost her. And I had a miserable Christmas because of it. So that's my long version of my theory on, on restorative justice. I think it's fantastic. And I think that done right, it can have a dramatic impact on your community. And that's the problem. And I, and I will not say that I know how to do it right. I will say that I've seen judges who do it right. And I've seen judges who do it wrong. And so it is walking a, a fine line. It's a lot like parenting. And you're trying to figure out what is it I need to say to this person to get through to them. And you know, when your child comes home and you're like, OK, is this the time that I do the time out? Is this the time that I take away the computer? Is this the, you know, what is it that's going to get through? It's the same kind of concept sitting on the bench trying to figure out what words am I going to say that might possibly make a difference. And then on the back of my mind, I have Judge Apple, who is a Superior Court judge in, in Snohomish County and a person I respect tremendously, whose words to me, and I, I know I'm in public here, but his words to me were to put a sign on my desk that says, shut your pie hole. <laughs> so. Can I ask one more question? Um, so how do you, um, how do you view the relationship between the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the ju judicial branch in the city? As with any government, all three branches have got to work together if you're going to succeed. Um, the judicial branch has its requirements. The executive branch has their requirements. And the legislative branch has their requirements. But if they're not working together and they're not communicating, no, nothing's going to get done. Um, it's a collaborative effort. Um, I don't think that you would think that the executive branch doesn't need the legislative branch to get things done in the city. And as a judge, I don't think that I can get things done without the workings of the executive branch and the legislative branch. So, Great, so. thanks. Uh, um, I appreciate um, that you seem to treat your community as a family. And so welcome to the family of Bothell. Thank you very much. We haven't voted her in yet. Hold on. <laughs> Is there any other? Uh, Councilor McCullough? Thank you, and uh, whoop, you're not done yet. <laughs> Hi. Remember there's seven of us. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, so um, I'm very impressed with what I've heard so far tonight and, and the stories that you've told um, regarding your experiences. I, um, as you heard from our young people tonight that they're interested in a youth court, I think what you heard from was, of course, our leaders in our schools, but Basically, my experience with youth councils, is, I'm sorry, I said youth court, but I meant youth council, is that it's the, it's the child or the young person who doesn't have a voice in many other things. They aren't the president of the ASB. They aren't the soccer player, the football player. They're someone who comes forward because they want to contribute and be a part of the community, and they need to have a value. And my experience with um, when I was in the state senate and I had a youth council was that some of the kids that came and um, and tried to testify about bills they thought were important and issues they thought were important. It, one of them I'll never forget. I said to him when I interviewed him, "What would your friends say about you?" And he said um, they'd say I was a nerd, and he was. But he also ran for office eventually, and. Um, didn't win, but at least he was out there politically trying to do his thing. And so that's the voice that I care so much about, is the young people's voice. And so I hope that when we, when you look at the youth court, we might see some combination for our youth council as well. And that's a possibility I just want to raise. Also, 
Uh, let me ask you a question because it's really something I lived with for 24 years, and that was um, I want to know what your interpretation or what your thoughts are, however you want to answer it, on the Becca bill. And do you know the Becca bill? I, I think do you know do. The Becca bill. I'm sure you do. Um, the Becca bill does not really apply to your municipal court because we don't handle criminal cases that involve juveniles. Um, as far as the Becca bill is concerned, again, I've seen it used beautifully and well. Um, and I'm thinking of Judge Cowsert in particular when I was at juvenile court. Um, but I've also, again, with anything, it depends on who's wielding it. And so that's, that is, you know, I think it is, I think it is necessary. I think it's a good, good start in that direction. But I think that it's, um, again, it's up to each individual judge when you're sitting facing them, when, how their interpretation is and how they're going to handle that individual case. I guess that I had just a, another different look at how I felt our young people were handled by it. So, but I appreciate your, your, your conversation about it. Um, I guess I want to also uh, say, in, I, I think I was impressed with the fact that you are, um, you know that we are a diverse community and, um, but for Monroe, you have even more diverse community that you'll be, de that you dealt with, correct? Well, and interestingly, we have a very diverse community in Monroe, but the people that I dealt with were very regularly um, not representative of that. And um, I, contrary to the, the, the standard information that we're receiving, the number of people that I saw in my court routinely generally were people who were um, white and poor or homeless, sometimes by choice, often because of heroin addiction. Um, traffic infractions, I saw a nice diversity. <laughs> so, um, but not so much in the criminal arena. Interesting. I, I guess I really want to be sure that we are serving all of our different diverse citizens Absolutely. and cultures. And I think that what we were finding, we were kind of surprised by it, but I think in Snohomish County that's also borne out, not to the same degree as it is in Monroe, um, but I think it's also um, Monroe's fed by Sultan Index and um, Granite and uh, Gold Bar. I always get Granite Falls and Gold Bar. I don't know why I do that. <laughs> and Gold Bar, and I don't know that their communities are as diverse as Monroe's. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting, it's an, it was an interesting uh, juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate your, your staying to answer my questions as well and my curiosities, and congratulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna step down until somebody tells me to now. <laughs> Councilmember McNeil. Thank you. Uh, most of my um, the questions that I was going to ask uh, have already been answered. Um, Washingtonian to Washingtonian, um, yes. Um, <laughs> I'm I, I'm looking forward to reaching out to you more on your comments about the diversity and some of the differences that you saw within your court for different uh, types of infractions and things that happen. So I'm looking forward to in the future reaching out to you about that. Um, I love the fact that you've had the opportunity to not only work in a place like Monroe, but also in Kent. Um, because we know there's a heavy difference in Kent than there is in Monroe, than there is in Bothell. Mm -hmm. um, and your words about community resonate really well with me because it is all about community and how we work together. When you talk about the different legislative branches and, and courts and stuff and the police department and the fire department, we all serve the community. We're all working on behalf of the community. So I just wanted to thank you for your words uh, referencing the community. Thank you. Thank you. I probably shouldn't admit it, but I knew the Husky fight song before I knew the Pledge of Allegiance. Councilman Ragney. Well, that's good with me. <laughs> <laughs> what challenges do you see that you're going to have dealing with two different counties? Oh, boy. Um, well, it's very interesting because, I mean, they're logistic challenges. As far as the people are concerned, it's not going to be that big a difference in how I handle my court. But because municipal courts um, 
one of the things that I advise people of all the right is you have a right to a trial by a jury from the county from which you, in which you committed the offense. And so that's going to mean that we have to have jury pools from King County and jury pools from Snohomish County. And Courtney and I have already discussed some ways of addressing that that may help streamline the, the, the jury process. And, and again, we're, we're already talking and trying to work out how we can make things move a little bit more smoothly um, using, using our resources appropriately. I know that a community court is something that this, that this community wants, and so I'm looking at the, the resources that are there and seeing how can we siphon those off and get that going, and then, but still run our court efficiently, and, that's, and effectively, not just efficiently, but effectively. And so that's one of the things I'm looking at is how can we make that, the timing of the calendars is going to be crucial. Working with law enforcement, I talked, I met the chief earlier and I talked to him that we need to sit down and talk about it because his people are involved in, obviously as witnesses, but they're also involved in the transporting of individuals for court if they're in custody. And they're transporting, as I understand it, from three different jails. And so working on how we can coordinate with him, with his people, so that we don't have his officers sitting for two hours waiting to bring somebody up from holding while we're doing other things in court. And that's, that's a goal, that's not a promise, <laughs> that's a goal, but working on seeing if we can't figure that out. And so those are the logistic issues. We need to have the jury trials and we need to have the people transported. Other than that, I think that the, the issues are pretty straightforward. The law applies to everybody equally and it applies to everybody regardless of what county you're in, so. Thank you. Council Member Olson. So when we commissioned the court study that we had, uh, I think a, people, a lot of uh, the residents, citizens got nervous about some of the features of our court being lost. Um, one of them that we saw some emails about were the youth court. Have you had experience with that or are you thinking of having that in Bothell? So I participated last night in the, um, yes orientation for the this year's youth court. Um, my understanding in talking with Judge Gelson is that the youth court does not really use a lot of resources from the court. Um, the UW Bothell puts on a lot of the administrative aspects of it. Um, I think they did their own fundraiser to raise monies um, for a banner, maybe some t-shirts, things like that. So it's not really a huge amount of expense to the city so then it's looking at what are the benefits. And I will be blunt, youth court has not really been high on my gets me excited list. And so I'm looking at it. I'm watching it to see what happens. Um, I've been bitten by the restorative justice. And the kids that I saw last night don't need restorative justice. These are kids that are on their way. And so then the question becomes, and, I'm, and I understand from what I've been told, they are learning about restorative justice in the way that it's applying to the students that are before them. And in that situation, then what we're doing is training the next level of, of administrators, bosses, politicians, judges about restorative justice. And so in that case, there is a definite benefit to the community of those, of those students learning that. Um, you know, my time, it looks like they want one night a month from me. That's not that big of a commitment for me. So to me, then, if we're getting that, that payback from it, then it's worth it. But again, it's not been something I've focused on, so I have to learn about it. And last night was a step towards that. Thank you very much. I mean, that's a blunt, straightforward, you know, honest answer, and that's exactly what we're looking for. So, thank you, Councilmember Zorns. Well, I do have a question, but it's not a grilling question, <laughs> because I think <laughs> they did their job in the grilling. Um, uh, observation is because I value restorative justice with a good, healthy balance, and what I see and observe in you. So don't let me down. <laughs> is is someone who can look at people who are maybe feeling invisible, mm -hmm. 
bringing them into a sense of community. And I think that's really an important part of why we have a court here in Bothell is we're here to take care of our own mm -hmm. and and help them get better because they have value. And so I see you express that. I have confidence from the staff that they've done their homework and their conversations with you that yes, you are that kind of person, so I really appreciate it. So my only question is, German Shepherds, black and red, black and tan, sable. I have, so my big guy is, they said he was a sable when we got him, we got him as a pup, and he has turned out red and, red and black. Okay. He's, he's gorgeous saddleback. Yeah. He's movie star gorgeous. Okay. Um, my little female is a rescue, and she's the black and tan. Okay. And my black lab is also a rescue, and he's all black. And probably thinks he's a German Shepherd, too. No. Or is he like, they'll take care of that, and um, he <laughs> I'll is, be the lab. <laughs> he, he's my lap lab. Yeah. He's okay. about 90 pounds, and he thinks he's supposed to sit in my lap all day. Okay. Got so. it in balance. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. I hope we have a chance to cross paths and... Build Looking this community to together. Yeah. And by the way, um, I haven't started quite yet, but if I do, I'm going to invite you all to come and visit court. Um, in Monroe, some of the council members, you know, they, it was a new court. They hadn't done it before. And they actually found it very interesting. And I, I always think it's, it's repetitious, and so people are going to be bored. But evidently, they were actually quite interested and found it exciting to be there. And I welcome you all to come and, and watch court and see what we're doing. All right, thank you. I uh, just got one more word of wisdom for you. No, you don't have to get it. Go ahead, sit down. You're good. You're good. <laughs> um, just back to what we were talking about earlier about the court study. Um, just be sure to, if you have stuff that when you come and talk to the council, do tell us. Um, we started that court study because it just came to our attention. There's four million dollars in need in capital costs, and for eight, eight years, I seven years I was here, I didn't hear a word about it. So. Do communicate, come talk to us. <laughs> All right, so is there a uh, motion? <laughs> oh, hit the button. Hold on. Yes, I would so move that we adjust, um, adopt the ordinance conferring the city manager's appointment of Judge Mara J. Rosano to the municipal court judge position and allow the city manager to sign an employment agreement with Judge Rosano. Second. It's moved by uh, Councilor McAuliffe, second by Councilor Agnew to adopt the ordinance confirming the city manager's appointment to Judge Mara J. Rosano to the municipal court judge position to and, al to and allow the city manager to sign an employment agreement with Judge Rosano. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, place your vote. And it passes unanimously. Welcome aboard. The, welcome to the family. Uh, let's see. Yeah. No clapping, <laughs> council chambers. Uh, so new business, AB 19-160-2019-2020, mid-biannual uh, budget review presentation. And I believe that will come from Mr. Bothwell. All right, so this is your mid-biennial budget review. Um, I'm gonna start by telling you why we do this. Um, cities that adopt a two-year biennial budget are required by state statute to go in at the end of that first year or near the end of the first year and take a look at revenues um, and compare how their actual performance of revenues is relative to the amounts that were budgeted. Uh, and so that's why we do this review. Um, the purpose of that is just to make sure that we don't get to the end of the biennium and have any surprises. Um, so, and just to maintain operational alignment between uh, resources and uh, operations or expenditures. So we've performed the review. Uh, and the first step in the process is to do a detailed review of revenues. So we go line by line uh, through every revenue of the city uh, and take the data that we have thus far in the biennium and basically reproject the data and we look for variances. So we also create kind of a threshold where we where identify uh, significant variances. And for this review, that significant variance threshold was $200,000. Uh, 
Um, so we also look at expenditures, but we look at them more broadly. So we look at them at the, at the department level, and we just look for trends that look like you know, things might get away from us or things that might need to be addressed uh, during the midpoint that we wouldn't want to go to the end of the period. Uh, and then we to put both those pieces together, revenue performance with expenditure performance, and consider whether or not we need to make an adjustment or propose an adjustment. All right, so the results of our review, um, and none of this should be a surprise because we do. This is going to sound a lot like your quarterly updates. Uh, we found four items of significance in the general fund, the first one being sales tax, which I was at your last meeting talking about sales tax performance. It's lagging budgeted amounts a little bit um, by about 3 to 5 percent. We do have some additional data since the last time I was here talking about sales tax, uh, and it's July data, and it's lagging by about 3 percent as well. So it's not rebounding like we had hoped. Um, it's important to note with sales tax, though, that we are still um, about three three and a half percent above where we were year to date last year. So it is still increasing, uh, just not at the rate that was presumed in the budget. Uh, the second one is utility taxes and utility taxes. Also, I told you about last time I was here. Um, primarily, telephone utility taxes are lagging budgeted amounts, um, which is kind of it's a trend. Uh, and so we've included an adjustment for uh, that lagging revenue as well. And the third one is probation revenue. Uh, we're proposing an adjustment, or we identified an adju a possible adjustment for probation revenue. Uh, they had $800,000 budgeted for probation revenue. It's just not coming in. Uh, we inquired to the court about that, and there's apparently a new state law that prohibits them from billing uh, indigent uh, folks of the uh, probation clients. Um, so we've adjusted that down by $600,000. And the final item in the general fund is the ground emergency medical transport revenue that I talked about last time I was here as well. Um, and that's the new revenue that was unbudgeted uh, that the fire department's been pursuing. And we're budgeting that up. It was unbudgeted, so we're adding a uh, million uh, 250000 to the budget for that. So that's the uh, total for revenue adjustments for the general fund. Uh, the total impact is $1.6 million. Uh, there was one revenue that was also rose to the item of, uh, was a significant item outside of the general fund, and that was real estate excise tax, uh, which we've talked to you about before too. Uh, and that's trend, continues to trend about five to $600,000 above budgeted amounts. So a positive trend there as well. And then on expenditures, uh, in the first six months of the year, general fund expenditures were about a million dollars below what, where we would expect them to be. Um, and we're hopeful that trend will continue. But we scheduled that item just for the savings that we've already identified, which was a million dollars. So the net impact to the general fund was $650,000. That's the possible adjustment value. Uh, it's less than 1%. It's just barely over half a percent of the total general fund operating budget. Uh, and so our recommendation is that we not make an adjustment. Uh, it's a relatively small amount. Uh, we're recommending a wait-and-see approach to this. Uh, we'll continue to bring you timely quarterly reports, and any emerging issues that are affecting the finances, we'll bring those to you as well. Um, and so that's our recommendation. Uh, this has also seemed like a good opportunity to remind you about the structural deficit, which is the condition where general fund revenues grow slower than general fund expenditures, primarily as a result of the 1% property tax limitation. Um, and so I know it was a topic that you guys discussed during budget development last cycle, and I just wanted to remind you that it's something we didn't really address fully, uh, and so we'll need to continue that conversation during budget development of 21-22. And you see evidence of that um, in the revenue results from the first, uh, first half of the biennium. So that's the end of your presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Deputy Mayor. The um, sales tax revenue, was there any impact from the closing of Country Village? Um, we don't get sales tax data by location. So we have a single location code for the entire city, so we can't tell. We could look at individual businesses and identify how much sales tax we were generating from them. Um, as long as we have a rep representative sample, we could go in and, and pull that data and, and try and figure that out. Um, but. They don't, we don't have reports that we can pull based on specific locations within the city. It's all just the city. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Hmm? Councilmember Zorns? Of course, I'm going to have a comment. So thank you for helping us understand this. Um, I just wanted to thank you for two things. One was uh, the new construction estimates that that you're not um, 
going to be, I phrased it as counting your chickens before they're hatched. So I appreciated the um, modesty and consider in how we treat that. We don't start anticipating funds just because there's a little bump. Um, and then the care and the recruitment expenditures, and I have a hunch that that's partly our credits to our city manager. Um, I appreciate just taking extra care in that. So thank you. Well, I'll give you a comment. And I think you're doing a great job as our finance director. Um, for years, we just didn't get this many reports and updates. And I just really appreciate it, especially coming into a, you know, we're almost into budgeting season. I know you guys are probably just about ready to hit the button on starting the next biannual budget. But it's really good for, to inform us to kind of to damper our expectations as well as give us the real, the real deal uh, live scenario of what you're seeing uh, with the economy and the revenues. So I really appreciate it. It's, it's really helpful. So, yeah, we grew up together. So um, is there, oh wait, we've got one more thing on the agenda. Mr. Bothwell, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> oh, Council Carmen, you guys want to converse? Are we good? Oh, we got people who want to converse. Oh, look at this. Go for it. All right. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've heard um, Councilmember Agnew, uh, McNeil, and um, Olson talk about it in the past, but I want to bring this to your attention tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about the North Shore Senior Center and their Health and Wellness Center, and I'm asking that the City Council make an endorsement at the next meeting, not tonight, but I want to give you an opportunity to know a little bit more about what's happening amongst our different cities. So you all know that North Shore Parks and Recreation Service Area Prop 1 will be on the ballot November, in November. And without our support and help, we may lose the Senior Center. You all know, and I think uh, Councilman McNeil stated it as well, that they have shut down the Redmond Senior Center because of their maintenance problems, and that could well happen to our senior center as well. There's 5,000 seniors out there and people with families with disabilities and needs that are being served there right now. And as a city, I think we need to endorse this. The, I've been out doorbelling, so I can just tell you that the public is somewhat confused. They don't know that North Shore Park and Recreation Service Area Prop 1 is the senior center. So, Clarifying that by this council will make a big difference. I also want you to know that both Kenmore and Woodenville City Council have already endorsed this levy. And um, I think as, as a, it's cited in Bothell and I would hope that we would consider that endorsement from our city council people. Um, it's really interesting to see the support out there as I'm doorbelling about how people feel about this center and the senior center and they all want to see it continue they all want to support it but they need we need more education and the only way we're going to be able to educate them is if we as a council reach out and um, talk about the need to support our seniors so i'm going to ask you to bring it forward at the next meeting for a vote for endorsement so i think it was our last Meaning that we did discuss this, and the majority council did not want to endorse, not because not because of the senior center topic specifically, but we, if, as a practice, do not uh, endorse levies and bonds of other government agencies. I agree with that discussion, and I was part of that. But I think, given that Kenmore Council and Woodenville Council has endorsed, I think we should reconsider. I, I need direction if you'd like me to put that on the agenda. What would you? We go down the line again. Um, and which end of the line would you want to start? <laughs> I understand that we really don't want to. I truly believe, uh, like uh, Councilmember McCullough, that we should get behind this. Uh, uh, I'm an advocate for it. I've been an advocate. I endorsed it as as a, a person. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing us endorse it. This is going to have huge ramifications for the entire community. Uh, I, I think people need to know what it is. 
Uh, if there's some miscommunication out there and they don't understand that, you know, if we can rectify that and clarify that, I think that's a good thing. And I again would want to bring it forward for the next meeting. And um, I just want you to know that we're all going to be seniors one day. We're all going to need a senior center. And even today, many of us still use it. And I just think it's a heart of bottle and that we should endorse it. Um, I've said many times where I stand on the senior center is the chair of the NPRSA, North Shore Parks Rec Service Area. Um, I too understand that the community doesn't understand the um, what the NPRSA is all about. There's a there's an education piece that needs to go on. Um, I'm a little concerned about um, setting precedents, um, but 110 percent, 120 percent. I'm out knocking on doors and personally. I support it, um, but it's. I think this is up to the council whether or not um, we're going to support or endorse uh, endorse that. Um, but I am 100% behind the senior center. I always have been, and will always continue to be. Um, so I'm with everybody. I I totally support the senior center. Um, at least everybody's spoken so far. Um, I do think we need to make an investment in it. Um, I just do not support the city council endorsing other people's. Uh, or other local government levies. Um, it's just a tidal wave of stuff that we're going to deal with every year from this point forward. If we open the floodgate, and I don't think it's fair to allow this one through and not others. Um, so, yeah, I, w I would not support trying to endorse it. Um, kind of to that end, too, I mean, the, the decision was made by that board to put that on the ballot at the last minute. Um, and I think it's it is important to point out that yeah people do not know what this is. I, even a nurse that works there asked me about it because they didn't know what it was. Um, but that's you know that's a lesson to be learned uh, when we did a um, a levy for the um, police public safety and the fire stations. We uh, I don't know how long the informational effort was, but it was about a year long. So. Um, it is important to educate the community. I think it, if we make uh, a decision to endorse it at mid-October and the elections two weeks later, I don't really even think that would have much of an impact, to be honest with you, at this point. So um, that's right, Stan. I um, I agree, and I'm uh, if if we were to decide to endorse uh, this MPRSA, then I would be bringing forward the car tabs because that's gonna have as much, if not a bigger impact, because there will go BRT on 405 and 522, and then where does it end? Um, believe me, if it doesn't pass, I'm gonna hear it every time my mom calls me, because she's at the senior center three times a week. Um, so I, I totally support the senior center. I just think breaking precedent is, I just don't know if it's worth it. So I'm, I'm not in favor. Uh, I agree with, precedent setting. I don't believe that we should um, use the city council for endorsing outside agencies. Uh, personally, I support the North Shore Senior Center and the NPRSA. Uh, I'm on the board with Council Member McNeil and Council Member Agnew, and uh, I'll, I'll personally reach out to Brooke and see what I can do. Uh, because I think education is important, really linking the North Shore Senior Center with the NPRSA, because from my understanding is the ballot is gonna say NPRSA and people are like, what is this? Um, but you say North Shore Senior Center and everybody instantly recognizes that and has that uh, you know, support for it. So I think that's our biggest impact that we can have is reach out to people and get that connection between the agency and the North Shore Senior Center. But I do not support the uh, supporting of the endorsements and breaking that precedent. Um, I understand when it's something this important that the panic of trying to make sure that the message gets out so that knowing that it ca people care about it can weigh in on it. And this is kind of the 11th hour panic of, of making sure everybody is engaged on a very important topic. 
a very important issue, a very important part of Bothell. Um, the Chili Fest was at the Senior Citizen Center today. I mean, it's a, it's a hub for a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, like Deputy Mayor Dewar said, though, where do we draw the line? Now, councils after us can say, we're going to change precedents. I don't want to hand that legacy off to the future councils. And even if we did have this precedence and do it, I don't know what the city can do. We don't have the resources as a city to do a mass mailing or anything that I think would bump it up significantly to get people out any more than doing word of mouth and talking with people. So the, I understand the panic and the concern. I don't want to set precedence and uh, I, don't th I, I don't think it would be effective an effective use of our time to to try to squeeze it in right before the ballots drop to probably come up with the same conclusion of no we can't set a new precedence for how the council runs itself so that's my two bits all right so now that we've gone down and we're not going to set precedence um, the senior center um, We've heard how many people that it serves. We understand the importance of the senior center within our community. Um, and I think we all as individuals um, could possibly step out and do some things to support the senior center. Um, the most important thing to realize is for the past 30 years, members of Kenmore, Bothell, Woodenville, King County and Snohomish County have been members of the NPRSA. This is not something that um, has happened overnight. This is something that's happened for the past 30 years. And regardless of if the bond passes or not, we're going to have to deal with the facilities because the facilities are in fact owned by the NPRSA, which are in fact part of all of our communities. And they are serving seniors within our community. So I know we're not gonna set precedents, but I think we owe it um, all of us sitting up here, myself, um, first and foremost as the chair of the NPRSA, to ensure that our community fully understands what the MP NPRSA is, North Shore Parks and Rec Service Area, and what it means um, to the seniors of our community to have those facilities. Um, I can't stress it enough, the 62% of the seniors that go to that facility are of low income. Um, there's Parkinson's uh, services that are offered at that service, that senior center that are not offered in any other senior centers um, in our area. It is the second largest senior center west of the Mississippi. Um, and I don't, and, I, and I'm just gonna speak frankly, this, we cannot, let this fail. We cannot let our community down. And again, I'm not setting precedents um, in saying that we're supporting this council, but I feel very strongly about this. I've worked very hard um, making sure that we bring all the parties together. Um, it, it's, it's a sad thing that, uh, you know, as an elected uh, city council member, um, being on that committee, not knowing what we're supposed to know on the committee, having things not run the way they're supposed to be run and trying to fix a problem, um, it's very frustrating. And um, I guess we saw a problem we're trying to fix the problem. Um, it's a shame that it came as late as it did and it's had to come as fast as it did, but um, I'm just gonna speak for myself. I do not ever want to have my community look back at me and say I didn't try, and I don't ever want our seniors to think that we're gonna let it fail like Redmond, and I don't think it's our Bothell's responsibility independently. Um, it is our community's responsibility to make sure that this passes, and we are the stewards to make sure that their voice is heard. And if I may conclude, I, I think, and I have the forms here for each of you to sign up to be endorsees, um, to endorse it, but I do think that as, um, when the public knows that Kenmore did it, the city of Kenmore and the city of Woodenville and Bothell does not, um, I hope you all can just stand up and say, but I individually endorse it because I think it's gonna be a big concern for our citizens to know that we didn't do this. All right, any, any other council conversations? Oh, there we go, Councilor Uh I'd like the citizens of Bothell to know that we have one of our firefighters uh, that it's battling a deadly disease. Uh, 
and it's not going very well for them. And, and I would just like the citizens uh, of this city to keep Kirk Robinson and his family and the Botham Fire Department in their thoughts and prayers. I, I, um, I have special background with Kirk. He was there when my daughter was born in my bathroom. And um, it, it breaks my heart. Any other council conversations? Good. All right, is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. Wow. How about a south second? Aye. Any discussion on the motion to adjourn? Place your vote. Uh, passes unanimously, we are adjourned.